The Asari were the first species to discover the citadel. When the Salarians arrived, it was the Asari who proposed the establishment of the Citadel Council to maintain peace throughout the galaxy. Since then, the Asari have served as the mediators and centrists of the Council. An all-female race, the Asari reproduce through a form of parthenogenesis. They can attune their nervous system to that of another individual of any gender and of any species to reproduce. This capability has led to the unseemly and inaccurate rumors about Asari promiscuity. Asari can live for over a thousand years, passing through three stages of life. In the maiden stage, they wander restlessly, seeking new knowledge and experience. When the matron stage begins, they meld with interesting partners to produce their offspring. This ends when they reach the matriarch stage, where they assume the roles of leaders and counselors. The second species to join the citadel, the Salarians are warm-blooded amphibians with a hyperactive metabolism. Salarians think fast, talk fast, and move fast. To Salarians, other species seem sluggish and dull-witted. Unfortunately, their metabolic speed leaves them with a relatively short lifespan. Salarians over the age of 40 are a rarity. The Salarians were responsible for advancing the development of the primitive Krogan species to use as soldiers during the Rachni Wars. They were also behind the creation of the genophage bioweapon the Turians used to quell the Krogan rebellion several centuries later. Salarians are known for their observational capability and non-linear thinking. This manifests as an aptitude for research and espionage. They are constantly experimenting and inventing, and it is generally accepted that they always know more than they are letting on. Roughly 1,200 years ago, the Turians were invited to join the Citadel Council to fulfill the role of galactic peacekeepers. The Turians have the largest fleet in Citadel space, and they make up the single largest portion of the Council's military forces. As their territory and influence has spread, the Turians have come to rely on the Salarians for military intelligence and the Asari for diplomacy. Despite a somewhat colonial attitude towards the rest of the galaxy, the ruling hierarchy understands they would lose more than they would gain if the other two races were ever removed. Turians come from an autocratic society that values discipline and possesses a strong sense of personal and collective honor. There is lingering animosity between Turians and humans over the First Contact War of 2157, which is known as the Relay 314 incident to the Turians. Officially, however, the two species are allies, and they enjoy civil, if cool, diplomatic relations. 50,000 years ago, the Protheans were the only spacefaring species in the galaxy. They vanished in a swift galactic extinction, only the legacy of their empire remains. They are believed to have built the mass relays and the citadel, which have allowed numerous species to explore and expand throughout the galaxy. Prothean ruins are found on worlds across the galaxy. While surprisingly intact for their age, functioning examples of Prothean paleotechnology are rare. Time and generations of looters have picked their dead cities and derelict stations clean. Some believe the Protheans meddled in the evolution of younger races. The Hanar homeworld of Kaje, for example, shows clear evidence of former Prothean occupation. The presence of a former Prothean observation post on Mars has caused a rebirth of interventionary evolutionists among humans. These individuals believe the god myths of ancient civilizations are misremembered encounters with aliens. Though now extinct, the Rachni once threatened every species in Citadel space. Over 2,000 years ago, explorers foolishly opened a mass relay to a previously unknown system and encountered something never seen before or since, a species of spacefaring insects guided by a hive mind intelligence. Unfortunately, the Rachni were not peaceful and the galaxy was plunged into a series of conflicts known as the Rachni Wars. Attempts to negotiate were futile, as it was impossible to make contact with the hive queens that guided the race from beneath the surface of their toxic home world. The emergence of the Krogan ended the Rachni Wars. Bred to survive the harshest environments, the Krogan were able to strike at the queens in their lairs and reclaim conquered council worlds. 
But when Krogan fleets pressed them back to their homeworld, the Rachni refused to surrender, and the Krogan eradicated them from the galaxy. In the early 2160s, the Alliance began aggressive colonization of worlds in the Skillian Verge, much to the dismay of the Batarians, who had been developing the region for several decades. In 2171, the Batarians petitioned the Council to declare the Verge a zone of Batarian interest. The Council refused, however, declaring unsettled worlds in the region open to human colonization. In protest, the Batarians closed their Citadel Embassy and severed official diplomatic relations with the Council, effectively becoming a rogue state. They instigated a proxy war in the Verge by funneling money and weapons to criminal organizations, urging them to strike at human colonies. Hostilities peaked with the Skillian Blitz of 2176, an attack on the human capital of Elysium by Batarian-funded pirates and slavers. In 2178, the Alliance retaliated with a crushing assault on the moon of Torfin, long used as a staging base by Batarian-backed criminals. In the aftermath, the Batarians retreated into their own systems and are now rarely seen in Citadel space. The Elcor are a Citadel species native to the high-gravity world Dakuna. They are massive creatures, standing on four muscular legs for increased stability. Elcor moves slowly, an evolved response to an environment where a fall can be lethal. This has colored their psychology, making them deliberate and conservative. Elcor's speech is ponderous and monotone. Among themselves, scent, slight movements, and subvocalized infrasound convey shades of meaning that make a human smile seem as subtle as a fireworks display. Since their subtlety can lead to misunderstandings with other species, the Elcor often go out of their way to clarify when they are being sarcastic, amused, or angry. Dakuna's high gravity impedes mountain formation. Most of the world consists of flat, open plains, which prehistoric Elcor wandered across in small family bands. Modern Elcor still prefer open sky and can become restless and uncomfortable on long starship journeys. The Geth are a humanoid race of networked AIs. They were created by the Quarians 300 years ago as tools of labor and war. When the Geth showed signs of self-evolution, the Quarians attempted to exterminate them. The Geth won the resulting war. This example has led to legal, systematic repression of artificial intelligences in galactic society. The Geth possess a unique distributed intelligence. An individual has rudimentary animal instincts, but as their numbers and proximity increase, the apparent intelligence of each individual improves. In groups, they can reason, analyze situations, and use tactics, as well as any organic race. Geth space is located at the trailing end of the Perseus arm, beyond the lawless Terminus systems. The Perseus veil, an obscuring dark nebula of opaque gas and dust, lies between their space and the Terminus systems. The Hanar are a citadel species known for excessive politeness. They speak with scrupulous precision and take offense at improper language. Hanar that expect to deal with other species take special courses to help them unlearn their tendency to take offense at improper speech. All Hanar have two names. The face name is known to the world. The soul name is kept for use among close friends and relations. Hanar never refer to themselves in the first person in conversation with someone they know on a face name basis. To do so is considered egotistical. So instead they refer to themselves as this one or the impersonal it. Their homeworld, Kajay, has 90% ocean cover and orbits an energetic white star, resulting in a permanent blanket of cloud. Due to the presence of Prothean ruins on the world, many Hanar worship them, and Hanar myths often speak of an elder race that civilized them by teaching them language. When the Asari discovered the Citadel, they also discovered the Keepers, a docile, multi-limbed insect race that seemingly exists only to maintain and repair the great Prothean station. Early attempts to communicate with or study the Keepers were failures. 
and it is now illegal to interfere with or impede keeper activity. Because they are completely non-threatening, keepers have become virtually invisible to everyone else. Similarly, they seem indifferent to other species, except for their tendency to help new arrivals integrate themselves into the citadel. No matter how many keepers die due to old age, violence, or accident, they maintain a constant number. No one has discovered the source of new keepers, but some hypothesize they are genetic constructs, biological androids created somewhere deep in the inaccessible core of the citadel itself. The Krogan evolved in a hostile and vicious environment. Until the invention of gunpowder weapons, eaten by predators was still the number one cause of Krogan fatalities. Afterwards, it was death by gunshot. When the Solarians discovered them, the Krogan were a brutal, primitive species, struggling to survive a self-inflicted nuclear winter. The Solarians culturally uplifted them, teaching them to use and build modern technology so they could serve as soldiers in the Rachni War. Liberated from the harsh conditions of their homeworld, the quick-breeding Krogan experienced an unprecedented population explosion. They began to colonize nearby worlds, even though these worlds were already inhabited. The Krogan rebellions lasted nearly a century, only ending when the Turians unleashed the Genophage, a Solarian-developed bioweapon that crushed all Krogan resistance. The Genophage makes only one in a thousand pregnancies viable, and today the Krogan are a slowly dying breed. Understandably, the Krogan harbor a grudge against all other species, especially the Turians. Driven from their home system by the Geth nearly three centuries ago, most Quarians now live aboard the migrant fleet, a flotilla of 50,000 vessels ranging in size from passenger shuttles to mobile space stations. Home to 17 million Quarians, the flotilla understandably has scarce resources. Because of this, each Quarian must go on a rite of passage known as the pilgrimage when they come of age. They leave the fleet and only return once they have found something of value they can bring back to their people. Other species tend to look down on the Quarians for creating the Geth and for the negative impact their fleet has when it enters a system. This has led to many myths and rumors about the Quarians, including the belief that underneath their clothes and breathing masks, they are actually cybernetic creatures, a combination of organic and synthetic parts. The Volus are a member species of the Citadel with their own embassy, but they are also a client race of the Turians. Centuries ago, they were voluntarily absorbed into the hierarchy, effectively trading their mercantile prowess for Turian military protection. Erun, their homeworld, lies far beyond the normal life zone of its star. However, the world has a high-pressure greenhouse atmosphere that traps enough heat to support an ammonia-based biochemistry. As a result, the Volus must wear pressure suits and breathers when dealing with other species, as conventional nitrogen-oxygen air mixtures are poisonous to them and in the low-pressure atmospheres tolerable to most species, their flesh will actually split open. Volus culture is tribal, bartering lands and even people to gain status. This culture of exchange inclines them to economic pursuits. It was the Volus who authored the Unified Banking Act, and they continue to monitor and balance the Citadel economy. After the Geth secure a location, they round up and impale dead and living bodies on mechanical spikes. The spikes rapidly transform these victims into withered husks, extracting water and trace minerals, and replacing them with cybernetics. The cybernetics reanimate the lifeless flesh and tissue, transforming the bodies into mindless killing machines. Some Alliance soldiers refer to the husk-generating spikes as dragon's teeth, a reference to the mythological berserkers who sprang up from the earth wherever the teeth of the dragon Eris were planted. Dragon's teeth and husks bear little resemblance to other pieces of Geth technology. No one is sure why a synthetic race would bother to drain the minuscule amount of recoverable resources from organic corpses, though the value of reusing them as shock troops is obvious. 
Thresher moths are subterranean carnivores that spend their entire lives eating or searching for something to eat. Threshers reproduce via spores that can lie dormant for millennia, yet are robust enough to survive prolonged periods in deep space and atmospheric re-entry. As a result, thresher spores appear on many worlds, spread by previous generations of space travelers. The body of a thresher never entirely leaves the ground. Only the head and tentacles erupt from the Earth to attack. In addition to physical attacks, Threshers have the ability to project toxic chemicals and emit bursts of infrasound as a shockwave weapon. The Alliance first encountered Threshers on the colony of Akuz in 2177. After contact was lost with the Pioneer team, Marine units were deployed to investigate. The shore parties were set upon by hungry Threshers and nearly the entire assault force was killed. Alliance forces recommend engaging threshers with vehicle-mounted heavy weapons. Varan are omnivores with a preference for living prey. Originally native to the Krogan home world of Tuchanka, they are, like most life from Tuchanka, savage, clannish, and consummate survivors. They are pack hunters when vulnerable prey is readily available and become scavengers when outnumbered or outclassed. Their supreme adaptability, vicious demeanor, and rapid breeding cycle have made them ubiquitous and dangerous pests on many worlds. Virtually everywhere the Krogan have been, Varan infestations have followed, wreaking havoc with the native ecology. The Krogan have had a love-hate relationship with Varan for millennia, alternately fighting them for territory and embracing them as treasured companions. To this day, Krogan raise them as beasts of war, one of the common subgenus of Varan has metallic silver scales, leading to the rather unusual nickname, fish dogs. The Citadel is an ancient deep space station, presumably constructed by the Protheans. Since the Prothean extinction, numerous species have come to call the Citadel home. It serves as the political, cultural, and financial capital of the galactic community. To represent their interests, most species maintain embassies on the Presidium, the Citadel's inner ring. The Citadel Tower in the center of the Presidium holds the Citadel Council Chambers. Council affairs often have far-reaching effects on the rest of the galactic community. Five arms, known as the Wards, extend from the Presidium. Their inner surfaces have been built into cities, populated by millions of inhabitants from across the galaxy. The Citadel is virtually indestructible. If attacked, the station can close its arms to form a solid, impregnable shell. For as long as the station has existed, an enigmatic race called the Keepers has maintained it. The Council is an executive committee composed of representatives from the Asari Republics, the Turian Hierarchy, and the Salarian Union. Though they have no official power over the independent governments of other species, the Council's decisions carry great weight throughout the galaxy. No single Council race is strong enough to defy the other two, and all have a vested interest in compromise and cooperation. Each of the Council species has general characteristics associated with the various aspects of governing the galaxy. The Asari are typically seen as diplomats and mediators. The Salarians gather intelligence and information. The Turians provide the bulk of the military and peacekeeping forces. Any species granted an embassy on the Citadel is considered an associate member, bound by the accords of the Citadel conventions. Associate members may bring issues to the attention of the Council, though they have no input on the decision. The Human Systems Alliance became an associate member of the Citadel in 2165. Citadel space is an unofficial term referring to any region of space controlled by a species that acknowledges the authority of the Citadel Council. At first glance, it appears this territory encompasses most of the galaxy. In reality, however, less than 1% of the stars have been explored. Even Mass Effect FTL Drive is slow relative to the volume of the galaxy. Empty space and systems without suitable drive discharge sites are barriers to exploration. 
Only the mass relays allow ships to jump hundreds of light years in an instant, the key to expanding across an otherwise impassable galaxy. Whenever a new relay is activated, the destination system is rapidly developed. From that hub, FTL drive is used to expand to nearby star clusters. The result is a number of densely developed clusters, thinly spread across the vast expanse of space, connected by the mass relay network. Spectres are agents from the Office of Special Tactics and Reconnaissance and answer only to the Citadel Council. They are elite military operatives, granted the authority to deal with threats to peace and stability in whatever way they deem necessary. They operate independently or in groups of two or three. Some are empathetic peacekeepers, resolving disputes through diplomacy. Others are cold-blooded assassins, ruthlessly dispatching problem individuals. All get the job done one way or another, often operating outside the bounds of galactic law. The Spectres were founded after the Solarians joined the Council. For many years, they operated in secrecy as backroom problem solvers. Only after the Krogan rebellions did their activities become publicized. Assignment of a Spectre is less contentious than a military deployment, but makes it clear that the Council is concerned about a situation. The the Citadel, the home world and capital of humanity, is entering a new golden age. The resource wealth of a dozen settled colonies and a hundred industrial outposts flows back to Earth, fueling great works of industry, commerce, and art. The great cities are greening, as arcology skyscrapers and telecommuting allow more efficient use of land. Earth is still divided among nation-states, though all are affiliated beneath the overarching banner of the system's alliance. While every human enjoys a longer and better life than ever, the gap between rich and poor widens daily. Advanced nations have eliminated most genetic disease and pollution. Less fortunate regions have not progressed beyond 20th century technology and are often smog-choked, overpopulated slums. Sea levels have risen two meters in the last 200 years, and violent weather is common due to environmental damage inflicted during the late 21st century. The past few decades, however, have seen significant improvement due to recent technological advances. Humanity's first contact with an alien race occurred in 2157, at that time, the Alliance allowed survey fleets to activate any dormant mass relays discovered, a practice considered dangerous and irresponsible by Council-aligned races. When a Turian patrol discovered a human fleet attempting to activate a relay, they attacked. One human vessel survived, retreating to the colony of Shanxi. The Turians followed, quickly defeating the local forces. Shanxi was occupied the first and, to date, only human world to be conquered by an alien species. The Turians believed the handful of ships they defeated represented the bulk of human defenses, so they were unprepared when the second fleet, under Admiral Castany Drescher, launched a strong counter-offensive, evicting them from Shanxi. The Turians mobilized for full-scale war, drawing the attention of the rest of the galaxy. The Council quickly intervened, forcing a truce. Fortunately for humanity, the first contact war was ended with a diplomatic solution. The Systems Alliance is an independent supranational government representing the interests of humanity as a whole. The Alliance is responsible for the governance and defense of all extrasolar colonies and stations. The Alliance grew out of the various national space programs as a matter of practicality. Sol's planets had been explored and exploited through piecemeal national efforts. The expense of colonizing entire new solar systems could not be met by any one country. With humans knowing that alien contact was inevitable, there was enough political will to jointly fund an international effort. Still, the Alliance was often disregarded by those on Earth until the first contact war. While the national governments dithered and bickered over who should lead the effort to liberate Shanxi, the Alliance fleet struck decisively. 
post-war public approval gave the alliance the credibility to establish its own parliament and become the galactic face of humanity. Humanity's first con... Pharos is a habitable world in the Attican Beta Cluster. Two-thirds of the habitable surface is covered with the ruins of a crumbling Prothean megatropolis. In the millennia since the Prothean extinction, the ruins have been repeatedly picked over by looters many times. Pharos was considered a poor prospect for colonization, as little open ground remains for agriculture. The only sizable freshwater sources are the poles, which are tapped by the decaying Prothean aqueduct systems. The dead cities, while in good condition considering their antiquity, are of uncertain stability. Ground level is congested by a dozen meters of fallen debris, and the air is fouled by dust. In 2178, the Human Exogeny Corporation announced its intention to place a permanent colony on Pharos to thoroughly explore the ruins. The pioneer settlement was placed on the upper levels of several intact skyscrapers, using the surviving Prothean aqueducts and rooftop hydroponic gardens to support the population. Noveria is a cool, rocky world with most of its hydrosphere locked up in massive glaciers. A privately chartered colony world, the planet is owned by the Noveria Development Corporation Holding Company. The NDC is funded by investment capital from two dozen high technology development firms and administrated by an executive board representing their interests. The investors built remote hot labs in isolated locations across Noveria's surface. These facilities are used for research too dangerous or controversial to be performed elsewhere, as Noveria is technically not part of Citadel space and therefore exempt from Council law. By special arrangement, Citadel special tactics and reconnaissance agents have been granted extraterritorial privileges, but it remains to be seen how committed the executive board is to that principle. Given its unique situation, it is understandable that Noveria is often implicated in all manner of wild conspiracy theories. Vermeer is a lush world located on the frontier of the Attican Traverse. Its vast seas and orbital position on the inner life zone have created a wide equatorial band of humid, tropical terrain. Only the political instability of the region has impeded efforts at colonization. Many times, the Citadel has opened negotiations to settle Vermeer with various criminal gangs and petty dictatorships in the nearby Terminus systems. All fell apart due to internal power shifts within the opposing parties. The Citadel has written off the colonization of Vermeer as impossible without significant political change. The Terminus powers themselves are unlikely to ever settle Vermeer. Most lack the resources to support settlement of a virgin world, finding it more expedient to steal from their neighbors than build for themselves. The Terminus systems are located on the far side of the Attican Traverse, beyond the space administered by the Citadel Council or claimed by the Human Systems Alliance. It is populated by a loose affiliation of minor species, united only in their refusal to acknowledge the political authority of the Council or adhere to the Citadel Conventions. Their independence comes at a price. The Terminus is fraught with conflict. War among the various species is common, as governments and dictators constantly rise and fall. The region is a haven for illegal activities, particularly piracy and the slave trade. At least once a year, a fleet from the Terminus invades the nearby Attican Traverse. These attacks are typically small raids against poorly defended colonies. The Council rarely retaliates, as sending patrols into the Terminus systems could unify the disparate species against their common foe, triggering a long and costly war. There are between two and four hundred billion stars in the galaxy, and less than one percent of them have ever been visited or had their systems properly surveyed. Humanity's early expansion into the Attican Traverse was haphazard, a desperate race to claim habitable planets where populations can be economically settled. Ignored in the wake of this land grab were thousands of less hospitable worlds, each potentially rich with industrial resources. The wealth of entire solar systems lies untapped, 
waiting for corporate survey teams or independent pioneers to discover and exploit them. However, this is not an easy task. In addition to the environmental hazards, the fact that uncharted worlds are largely ignored makes them popular bases for criminals, revolutionaries, cults, and others who wish to remain unnoticed by galactic society. Faster than light drives use element zero cores to reduce the mass of the ship, allowing higher rates of acceleration. This effectively raises the speed of light within the mass effect field, allowing high speed travel with negligible relativistic time dilation effects. Starships still require conventional thrusters, chemical rockets, commercial fusion torch, economy ion engine, or military anti-proton drive, in addition to the FTL drive core. With only a core, a ship has no motive power. The amount of ESO and power required for a drive increases exponentially to the mass being moved and the degree it is being lightened. Very massive ships or very high speeds are prohibitively expensive. If the field collapses while the ship is moving at faster than light speed, the effects are catastrophic. The ship is snapped back to sublight velocity, the enormous excess energy shed in the form of lethal Cherenkov radiation. The Normandy is a prototype starship developed by the Human Systems Alliance with the assistance of the Citadel Council. It is optimized for scouting and reconnaissance missions in unstable regions using state-of-the-art stealth technology. For most ships, the heat generated through standard operations is easily detectable against the absolute zero background of space. The Normandy, however, is able to temporarily sink this heat within the hull. Combined with refrigeration of the exterior hull, the ship can travel undetected for hours or drift passively for days of covert observation. This is not without risk. The stored heat must eventually be radiated or it will build to levels capable of cooking the crew alive. Another component of the stealth system is the Normandy's revolutionary Tantalus drive, a mass effect core twice the standard size. The Tantalus drive generates mass concentrations that the Normandy falls into, allowing it to move without the use of heat emitting thrusters. Sovereign is the flagship of the rogue Spectre's Saren. An enormous dreadnought larger than any other ship in any known fleet, it is crewed with both Geth and Krogan. At two kilometers long, its spinal-mounted main gun is likely capable of penetrating another dreadnought's kinetic barriers with a single shot. How Saren acquired this incredible warship is unknown. The prevailing opinion is that Sovereign is a Geth construct while others believe it is a Prothean relic. Its design, however, hints at a more alien and mysterious origin. The attack on Eden Prime demonstrated Sovereign's ability to generate mass effect fields powerful enough to land on a planetary surface. This implies it has a massive element zero core and the ability to generate staggering amounts of power. Ship mobility dominates space combat. The primary objective is to align the mass accelerator along the bow with the opposing vessel's broadside. Battles typically play out as artillery duels, fought at ranges measured in thousands of kilometers. Though assaults through defended mass relays often occur at knife fight ranges, as close as a few dozen kilometers. Most ship-to-ship -ship engagements are skirmishes between patrol vessels of cruiser weight and below with dreadnoughts and carriers only deployed in full-scale fleet actions. Battles in open space are short and often inconclusive, as the weaker opponent typically disengages. Once a ship enters FTL flight, the combat is effectively over. There are no sensors capable of tracking them or weapons capable of damaging them. The only way to guarantee an enemy will stand and fight is to attack a location they have a vested interest in, such as a settled world or a strategically important mass relay. The Mako Infantry Fighting Vehicle was designed for the System Alliance's frigates. Though the interior is cramped, an M35 is small enough to be carried in the cargo bay and easily deployed on virtually any world. 
With its turreted 155 millimeter mass accelerator and coaxially mounted machine gun, the Mako can provide a fire team with weapons support as well as mobility. Since Alliance Marines may be required to fight on any world, the Mako is environmentally sealed and equipped with microthrusters for use on low gravity planetoids. The Mako is powered by a sealed hydrogen oxygen fuel cell and includes a small element zero core. While not large enough to nullify the vehicle's mass, the core can reduce it enough to be safely airdropped. When used in conjunction with thrusters, it also allows the Mako to extricate itself from difficult terrain. Faster than... Biotics is the ability of rare individuals to manipulate dark energy and create mass effect fields through the use of electrical impulses from the brain. Intense training and surgically implanted amplifiers are necessary for a biotic to produce mass effect fields powerful enough for practical use. The relative strength of biotic abilities varies greatly among species and with each individual. There are three branches of biotics. Telekinesis uses mass lowering fields to levitate or impel objects. Mass raising kinetic fields are used to block or pin objects. Spatial distortion uses rapidly shifting mass fields to shred objects. Most organic species are capable of developing biotic abilities, though there are risks involved. Biotics are the result of an in utero exposure to element zero. This usually causes fatal cancers in the victim, but in rare cases, it coalesces into nodules within the fetus's developing nervous system. An artificial intelligence is a self-aware computing system capable of learning and independent decision-making. Creation of a conscious AI requires adaptive code, a slow, expensive education, and a specialized quantum computer called a blue box. An AI cannot be transmitted across a communication channel or computer network. Without its blue box, an AI is no more than data files. Loading these files into a new blue box will create a new personality, as variations in the quantum hardware and runtime results create unpredictable variations. The geth serve as a cautionary tale against the dangers of rogue AI, and in Citadel space, they are technically illegal. Advocacy groups argue, however, that an AI is a living, conscious entity, deserving the same rights as organics. They argue that continued use of the term artificial is institutionalized racism on the part of organic life. The term synthetic is considered the politically correct alternative. A virtual intelligence is an advanced form of user interface software. VIs use a variety of methods to simulate natural conversation, including an audio interface and an avatar personality to interact with. Although a VI can provide a convincing emulation of sentience, they are not self-aware, nor can they learn or take independent action. VIs are used as operating systems on commercial and home computers. Minimal VI agents are also available. Agents are compact and specialized. Some serve as personal secretaries, filtering calls and scheduling meetings based on user-defined priorities. Others are advanced search engines, propagating themselves across the extranet to collate user-requested data. Commercial VIs in a variety of stock personalities are available at any software retailer. Boutique firms and hobbyists also build unique VIs to personal specification. Although software emulation of living personalities is illegal, reconstructions of famous historical figures are common. When subjected to an electrical current, the rare material dubbed element zero, or ESO, emits a dark energy field that raises or lowers the mass of all objects within it. This mass effect is used in countless ways, from generating artificial gravity to manufacturing high-strength construction materials. It is most prominently used to enable faster-than-light space travel. ESO is generated when solid matter, such as a planet, is affected by the energy of a star going supernova. 
The material is common in the asteroid debris that orbits neutron stars and pulsars. These are dangerous places to mine, requiring extensive use of robotics, telepresence, and shielding to survive the incredible radiation from the dead star. Only a few major corporations can afford the setup costs required to work these primary sources. Humanity discovered refined element zero at the Prothean Research Station on Mars, allowing them to create mass effect fields and develop FTL travel. Element zero can increase or decrease the mass of a volume of space-time when subjected to an electrical current. With a positive current, mass is increased. With a negative current, mass is decreased. The stronger the current, the greater the magnitude of the dark energy mass effect. In space, low mass fields allow FTL travel and inexpensive surface to orbit transit. High mass fields create artificial gravity and push space debris away from vessels. In manufacturing, low mass fields permit the creation of evenly blended alloys, while high mass compaction creates dense, sturdy construction materials. The military makes extensive use of mobility-enhancing technologies, with mass effect utilizing fighting vehicles standard frontline issue in most military forces. Mass effect fields are also essential in the creation of kinetic barriers or shields to protect against enemy fire. Mass relays are feats of Prothean engineering advanced far beyond the technology of any living species. They are enormous structures scattered throughout the stars and can create corridors of virtually mass-free space, allowing instantaneous transit between locations separated by years or even centuries of travel using conventional FTL drives. Primary mass relays can propel ships thousands of light years, often from one spiral arm of the galaxy to another. However, they have fixed one-to-one -one connections. A primary relay connects to one other primary relay and nowhere else. Secondary relays can only propel ships across a few hundred light years. However, they are omnidirectional. A secondary relay can send a ship to any other relay within its limited range. There are many dormant primary relays whose corresponding twins have not yet been located. These are left inactive until their partner is charted. As established civilizations are unwilling to blindly open a passage that might connect them to a hostile species. Omni-tools are handheld devices that combine a computer microframe, sensor analysis pack, and mini-facturing fabricator. Versatile and reliable, an Omni-tool can be used to analyze and adjust the functionality of most standard equipment, including weapons and armor, from a distance. The fabrication module can rapidly assemble small three-dimensional objects from common reusable industrial plastics, ceramics, and light alloys. This allows for field repairs and modifications to most standard items, as well as the reuse of salvaged equipment. Omni-tools are standard issue for soldiers and first-in colonists. Combat hard suits use a dual-layer system to protect the wearer. The inner layer consists of fabric armor with kinetic padding. Areas that don't need to be flexible, such as the chest or shins, are reinforced with sheets of lightweight ablative ceramic. The outer layer consists of automatically generated kinetic barriers. Objects traveling above a certain speed will trigger the barrier's reflex system and be deflected, provided there is enough energy left in the shield's power cell. Armored hard suits are sealable to protect the wearer from extremes of temperature and atmosphere. Standard equipment includes an onboard mini frame and a communications, navigation, and sensing suite. The mini frame is designed to accept and display data from a weapon's smart targeting system to make it easier to locate and eliminate enemies. Kinetic barriers, more commonly called shields, provide protection against most mass accelerator weapons. Whether on a starship or a soldier's suit of armor, the basic principle remains the same. Kinetic barriers are repulsive mass effect fields projected from tiny emitters. These shields safely deflect small objects traveling at rapid velocities. This affords protection from bullets and other dangerous projectiles, 
but still allows the user to sit down without knocking away their chair. The shielding afforded by kinetic barriers does not protect against extremes of temperature, toxins, or radiation. A mass accelerator propels a solid metal slug using precisely controlled electromagnetic attraction and repulsion. The slug is designed to squash or shatter on impact, increasing the energy it transfers to the target. If this were not the case, it would simply punch a hole right through, doing minimal damage. Accelerator design was revolutionized by element zero. A slug lightened by a mass effect field can be accelerated to greater speeds, permitting projectile velocities that were previously unattainable. If accelerated to a high enough velocity, a simple paint chip can impact with the same destructive force as a nuclear weapon. However, mass accelerators produce recoil equal to their impact energy. This is mitigated somewhat by the mass effect fields that rounds are suspended within. But weapon recoil is still the prime limiting factor on slug velocity. Metagel is a common medicinal salve used by paramedics, EMTs, and military personnel. It combines several useful applications, a local anesthetic, disinfectant, and clotting agent all in one. Once applied, the gel is designed to grip tight to flesh until subjected to a frequency of ultrasound. It is sealable against liquids, most notably blood, as well as contaminants and gases. The gel is a genetically engineered bioplasm created by the CERTA Foundation, a medical technology megacorp based on Earth. Technically, Metagel violates council laws against genetic engineering, but to date, it has proved far too useful to ban. All modern infantry weapons, from pistols to assault rifles, use micro-scaled mass accelerator technology. Projectiles consist of tiny metal slugs suspended within a mass-reducing field, accelerated by magnetic force to speeds that inflict kinetic damage. The ammo magazine is a simple block of metal. The gun's internal computer calculates the mass needed to reach the target based on distance, gravity, and atmospheric pressure then shears off an appropriate sized slug from the block. A single block can supply thousands of rounds, making ammo a non-issue during any engagement. Top-line weapons also feature smart targeting that allows them to correct for weather and environment. Firing on a target in a howling gale feels the same as it does on a calm day at the practice range. Smart targeting does not mean a bullet will automatically find the mark every time the trigger is pulled. It only makes it easier for the marksman to aim. 